Welcome back to the It's Just Sport, a league of our own. I'm Joanna Reardon, and today, Niamh, we have a very special guest in the hot seat. Yes, today we have Orla Farmer with us. She is well known for playing ladies football ball with Middleton Juniors and also playing for Cork Senior Ladies Football Team. She has won six All-Ireland titles for the Cork Senior Ladies and also has a background in athletics, having previously represented Ireland internationally. Her UCC PhD study, Gaelic for Girls, specifically focuses on the promotion of female youth physical activity, sport participation among eight to 12 year old girls. She believes there are a significant future benefits for girls that are involved in sport from a young age. So we're here to talk a little bit about that, a little bit about you. Uh, so so let's get started. Um, I guess if we, we kick off a bit about why you started uh, the PhD and um, I guess go into a little bit about, uh, you know, your career and, and, and that type of thing. Like, did, is that what led you there? Um, I suppose really, um, you know, I've always had that kind of passion and that interest for for sport. And I think I kind of was a latecomer, um, as people would probably think now, like I was 11, I think, when I started playing football um, in primary school. And it was actually the ski in the skull in Cork. It's like, um, it'd be really like a big thing in the primary schools. And that's how I kind of first was introduced to football. And I suppose, you know, luckily enough, I had that opportunity to represent Cork um, and play with Middleton as well. Um, and I, I suppose my love kind of for, for the game kind of just progressed from there. And kind of I always kind of felt that like what I was what I was enjoying playing, but also outside of football, that like I kind of wanted to mirror my playing career with, you know, my, my actual career as well. So I think it was like, I suppose it, I, I, I studied PE teaching in, in Cork in UCC. Um, as my undergrad and I think I kind of got a bit of a flavour for you know research and research world but I think I always just had this kind of like thirst um, of knowledge to know like why girls are dropping out of sport and you know I think for, from my own experience it was actually my friends who had asked me to go and join the club in Middleton um, and like a few years later those girls actually just stopped and I was the only one who kind of stayed on and I always kind of had that question you know why why was I the one who stayed on and why didn't my friends stay on and um what what are the reasons um for, for dropping out of sport and I suppose as of recent years you know we are seeing that high dropout rate particularly coming into like the adolescence period so I think really that kind of like sparked a fire for me in terms of, of researching and you know I, I always would be interested in kind of learning the things and kind of questioning things um, so that kind of led me on my my PhD journey then in UCC. And um, the Ladies Gaelic Football Association had kind of made contact with UCC and um, my supervisor, Dr. Wesley O'Brien, he kind of brought it to me and said that, you know, you'd, you'd be the perfect candidate to take on this project. And this was, it was always kind of something I had been interested in in a way. Um, and because I played football myself, you know, up along the years and always had those questions at the back of my mind that I said, you know what, I'll just take on a whole 100,000 documents, 100,000 word document PhD <laughs> for my sins. But no, look, it, um, I'm, I'm really, really glad that I went down that, that route and learned so much, like, you know, about girls in sport and about coaching and, you know, about promoting, like, girls in sport and everything. And um, I, like, I, I'm very proud of, of the work as well that, that I have done because, if anything, it can, it can make that positive impact and that positive change for the next generation of girls and coaches coming up as well. Um, so, yeah, it's like, I suppose the thing with research is that what I like about it is that, you know, it's reliable and it's that evidence base behind it. It's not just kind of saying things for the sake of it. It's mm -hmm. the, the evidence is behind the mm -hmm. research. There. So it's based on what girls are actually saying in Ireland right now um, in terms of, you know, physical activity, ladies football, sport, what do they want? You know, what do they dislike? What motivates them? Um, what are the factors that are getting in the way? And um, is there anything we can do that can help that promotion? So, you know, that's the, the whole kind of purpose behind the research. Um, and I just did my research through the Gaelic for Girls programme. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it actually is an existing programme. The Gaelic for Girls programme is an, an existing programme with the mm -hmm. Ladies Gaelic Football Association, but there was actually no evidence base behind the programme that's then where I stepped in and I kind of have over the last few years put that evidence base there in order to improve the programme um, and I suppose kind of think up of new strategies based on the evidence of how we can try and kind of tailor 
the program to keep more girls at mm-hmm. it. Yeah. yeah, like you were, you know, you just mentioned that like Gaelic for Girls was always there and like, I remember I went to do a school talk and one of the girls was telling me, oh, we do Gaelic for Girls. I was like, oh, that's great. And she was like, yeah, like we did like a dance. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but like, what is it, I suppose, specifically in your, because I know from reading your like study that you like three kind of groups. So like one who did the spruced up one, which is your one, and then the normal Gaelic for Girls and then girls who did nothing at all. So like what was kind of spruced up about your Gaelic for Girls? And like, was it specifically tailored to like what the girls were saying to you? Like, oh, I don't like football because it's too boring and too rigid, like that kind of thing. Thing. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was tailored. So I had went out and I had actually done my research and, you know, I'd asked the girls, you know, what do they like? What don't they like about it? Um, and I, I suppose I got that kind of baseline research and then tailored the program. So one thing that I would have added was um, the dance, as you were saying, John. Um, so I suppose I, I kind of just got this notion one day when, when I had I was looking at my results and I was reflecting upon my results and I was kind of thinking like, these, these girls like have really low levels of physical activity you know they're not meeting the recommended 60 minutes of physical activity every day their skill level was really poor like shockingly poor I'm talking about basic skills now running skipping hopping jumping like these skills that children should be mastering when they're like 10 years of age really really poor in executing those skills um, and I suppose then like kind of things like barriers and motivators that were coming up was like girls were really expressing the fact that they love just that fun and social environment. Um, and then on the other hand, like kind of a barrier that was in the way was that of it being too competitive. So kind of the too competitiveness, like they liked a bit of challenge, but not in a sense that it was too competitive because it was actually, you know, causing girls to, to stop and, and not enjoy it as football. Um, and also other, you know, body confidence, image, um, all of those things were creeping in as well. I think like really with, with dance, um, I had included it as part of my, my research program because it kind of like encapsulated everything. So, you know, the whole area behind it was that I wanted to try and give girls that opportunity to, first of all, get physically active, get out of breath. You know, they're going to be dancing. Girls love to dance. It's fun. They're with their friends. Um, it, it all kind of fosters like self-confidence, self-esteem, you know, that feel-good environment whereby they actually are enjoying themselves being with their friends because essentially that's what they were saying. That's what was coming through in the research was that they want more opportunities for it to be fun, for them to, to you know, play with their friends, but also to challenge themselves and learn the skill as well. So, so they just really kind of thought that dance was like, you know, Girls just want to have fun, like, and they want to dance at the end of the day. And why not merge the skills of ladies football and basic fundamental movement skills with a bit of music, with a football and, you know, choreograph a dance. And it worked really, really, really well. Um, it was really positive um, from, like, the intervention itself. Um, and it's something that we're kind of looking at going forward. And, you know, you know yourself now, like, with TikTok and everything, that's after changing <laughs> off. Like, there's such... Like, like there's such a gap there and there's such, like yeah like such an opportunity to kind of merge you know football and dance and kind of make it attractive and make it cool because that's a massive thing for girls is like body image and like you know self-confidence and mm. like things like dance and things like you know being with the, the peer influence and music and tiktok and all these things like that's what they're interested in and you kind of mm. have to make it relevant to what they like now um, and to garner their interest and to try and keep them involved and stay involved. So the dance was one aspect. Um, and then, you know, girls kind of express that need that they they wanted to be with their friends. And, you know, how could we try and get more, more of that into training sessions? So another thing that would have been part of my research program was kind of giving them, a you know, a five, 10 minute opportunity in the training session to do some like team challenges, activities, fun team challenge activities so that they actually get the chance to talk to each other, you know, to have a bit of a laugh. Like girls love to chat. If you go to any training session before the training, in between the training, after the training, it's all chit chat and it's all the gas and it's all the news. Um, so give them that opportunity because that's what they like, you know, and you can still have a successful training session. But at the end of the day, you know, you need to meet their needs as well. And if they're yeah. saying that they like that social environment, then you know you you have to create that then it within the session because ultimately they will enjoy it more and then they'll want to come back the next day 
if you get yeah. me. <laughs> Yeah, I think like it's it's such a critical age as well, because particularly as people had towards secondary school, like I, I know you're looking at eight to, to 12, and like if, as people had towards secondary school, like it's a really easy time to say, actually, no, I'm not going to participate in sport anymore. And then the more you head into secondary school and towards college and stuff, there's kind of more reasons for people to stop. So if you manage to, like you say, uh, you know, keep them interested, and I think it's like the dancing and stuff sounds fun and like the chit chat, like you're totally right. I'm um, like, I even know from say the panels and stuff that I've been on like people just love to chat like girls teams are so are so chatty I think in comparison in comparison to boys teams <laughs> not that there aren't chatty boys there obviously are but um yeah even I'm thinking like kind of the team aspect of it like I'm um, we used to kind of do relay team uh, things kind of and everybody always used to look forward to it, like boys and girls but it used to like you say create that environment where people were like rooting for each other kind of planning things together having that opportunity to chat and making things like a bit of fun so like you're obviously getting the benefit from doing the training and you know pushing yourself but it's in a fun way and I think that's that is what is missing uh sometimes in different sports uh, where they're not kind of understanding like what you're saying the perspective of these you know young girls and making sure that they're giving them the, what they're looking for because if you don't manage to retain them like you know they're they don't they're not um, like obliged to show up do you know what I mean uh, it's not as if someone's paying them to show up or it's part of their like you know if you're part of a team that's outside like after school or it's outside of school like if somebody's not interested they're just going to stop um so I think it is really important particularly at this age that we that we try and keep people involved but um yeah like definitely it's it's so important and like the like you're saying the confidence and everything I think that's something that like we have kind of like we're obviously really you're passionate really about keeping girls in sport um you know from and, and we do cover some of those topics like the some some topics that are often kind of considered to be so whether it be body image and menstrual cycle and that type of thing but um yeah i know it's, it's really interesting to kind of hear what your experiences have been um what do you think like is the impact of girls say participating in sport and how can we have things changed um in the past number of years because what you mentioned earlier in relation to the kind of skills that children are lacking I've I've heard that um more recently like my cousin is eight and her dad was involved in kind of coaching I think I think it was their football team actually for a while and he was shocked at the lack of fitness lack of skills that young children had like you're saying like these basic skills that you think people pick up along the way so like how have things changed over the last few years that we have, we have that name? Yeah, I suppose really like when when you look at even just the skill itself, um, you know, obviously things have improved in the game, but like even if you just look at like children like now in in this day and age in 2021, um, and like over the past few years, it is very very worrying. Um, <laughs> I suppose like obviously children probably aren't out as much, and you know, with technology that plays a big role too because. Like I know when I was younger, I used to be out and about climbing trees, jumping on walls. Yeah, same. <laughs> I think like we can all relate to just, you know, like that kind of expressing your own movement. And that's not happening now anymore because of technology, because of, you know, surplus safety. Kids aren't even let run in schools anymore because of insurance. Mm-hmm. So like we are seeing that impact. Um, and I think it's down to a lack of education too, you know, like, um, like some maybe coaches, some teachers don't actually understand fully the concept of, you know, I guess was giving children that opportunity to express themselves and perform these skills. Like we we have to remember that these skills are, have to be taught and learned. Like they're not just skills. We can't assume that, you know, an eight-year-old girl can can skip or run. Mm-hmm. Like we, they, these skills actually have to be taught. And I think that's often overlooked as well. Um, and I think like just from the research point of view, like what the research has found is that there's actually a direct like association, a positive association between being confident you know, when you're younger at these basic skills and lifelong participation in, you know, sport and physical activity. And um, so like if we can kind of develop these skills at like, you know, from from when they're young all the way up, then they will intrinsically be motivated because you know yourself if you're embarrassed to perform a skill or if you're not confident at doing something you're you're going to want to stay away from it because it doesn't make you feel good so I think it's about like creating that culture and I think it is actually getting way better and to be fair to the ladies getting football association you know they're really really big on coach education and they're really like big on programs like Gaelic for girls Gaelic for teens you know even Gaelic for mothers and others and all these initiatives mm-hmm. that 
it's all about kind of, you know, empowering coaches, empowering young girls, like instilling that confidence in them so that they can perform these basic skills. But by the time they get to, you know, adulthood or when they're, you know, in college and, and progress on that, they will have a confidence, they'll be competent in their ability to perform these skills and more than likely will stay involved. Um, so it's kind of like, you kind of have to catch them early in one sense. Yeah. Like you, you, you want to give them that solid, positive foundation so they can build upon like that skill um, because, you know, they will, they will intrinsically then want to be, come back to a training session, want to maybe even go at an elite level. Um, not everybody will want to be an elite player. Like it's important to note that like not everyone will want to play for their county or represent, you know, their provision or their country. And, and that's okay too. It's, it's more just having the skill set themselves so that it'll open up even more opportunities. And I'm talking about off the pitch opportunities now as well, not just, you know, playing football. Like we all know the benefits of physical activity and playing football. But like for me personally, it's opened up so many opportunities like with my career, you know, just outside of football. Not not even that, but it's just even instilled so many values in me, mm-hmm. like resilience and, um, you know, reacting to adversity, you know, dealing with my emotions um, all of that, like the social aspect of it, um, losing games, you know, winning games, like all of that plays its part in in the bigger picture of sport and the bigger picture of playing and, you know, soloing a ball. Like there's much more to it than just soloing a ball and hand passing a ball or putting the ball over the bar that like it opens up so many opportunities. And like it's so great to see like with the 2020 campaign there recently and like even in the last few years, I've even noticed such a change in just the attitudes like towards women in sport. And um, not only that, but like things like attendance. I think um, I was only thinking there earlier on that I think it was 2011 when we played, um, I think it was the area that man had up in Cope Park. Um, in, and it was, I think it was like 18, 19,000 maybe at the game. And like that would have been a lot for that time. But like for those figures to nearly have tripled, like in mm-hmm. the, what eight nine years, yeah. um, nine to ten years, like goes like that in itself just shows the you know the progression and the positivity, like the momentum and and the shift kind of in, in the perception of women in sport as well. Um, and it does like I mean it, it's not going to just happen like that, like but just from my own playing experience, like it has come such a long way. Um, and that does boil down to small things like you know developing skill, developing confidence in players, making the sessions fun, you know, allowing that time for social interaction. Like it all boils down to what you can do in that hour mm-hmm. a week with the girls. Because that's going to like completely shift their attitudes towards you know wanting to come back and play for their with their club and be part of that team environment and you know be part of a setup that they're going to make friends. You know that they're going to they're going to. Get, gain values from as well so it's all a positive really and like to be honest I do think we are after coming a long way and um, we still have a good a good chunk of a way to go yet but um we have to we have to remain positive like and we have to like you know any opportunity that we get that we can try and promote girls in sport and and that and shift an attitude as well it's gonna like ask you in general about um like about coaching and kind of different uh things like that like i know like for example like a couple of coaches around town if you went into them and they're under say they're under 12 team or whatever it may be and you're like oh let's do like a dance and bulldog and different things like that like they triple blink at you because they'd be like no we have to like win games you know like that kind of thing and i'm like no like it's all about like building like the fun so like how would you say like you know when you kind of went into like different um coaching sessions and things like that how did you kind of break it down in a way that you were like well no, like winning isn't important up until like a certain age. You know, you have to like bring the, like bring them and they'll come and then you build it on from there. So how do you explain it to a coach who's only going to have a crack at like these under 12s for like six months? Yeah, Less now with COVID. Actually, no, that's a really important question because um, and it's, it's a question I get all of the time um, because obviously, you know, coaches, players want to win. Um, and then what the girls are saying is they want to have that healthy competition. I call it healthy competition and in a sense that, yes, the girls do want to win. We are competitive. I'm not yeah. saying we don't want to be competitive and we just want to have fun all the time and have a bit of a laugh. That's not the case. But the, the most important thing, I think, is to like merge the two. So it's kind of like balancing. It's a balancing act between 
enjoying yourself, but also like getting the best out of yourself. And I think they link together because fun is a very like elusive. It's a very broad concept. Like you can't like really define like what fun means to me would be very different to what fun means to you or for what fun means to my coach. So like it's more about getting to know your players and getting to know what they want. And like personally, like even with Cork, like the most enjoyable sessions in the last few years, even coming up to an All-Ireland where we have to be like at our fittest and, you know, most focused. The sessions that I remember are the ones that we actually had a bit of a laugh in and we enjoyed. And like, I'm not saying like there is a way around merging the competitiveness and the fun, but like because of the fact that the research is saying that girls deem fun as number one for their motivator, that's what draws them into the sport, then you need to try and, and merge the two of them together. Like it's a balancing act, but like, it depends on your players as well. There's no right or wrong answer. And that's just about getting to know your players. Like you you really can. It can be a successful team and you can go on and win a championship if that's your goal. Uh, but you can have fun along the way as well. You know, coaches are kind of, I think it's a lack of education to a certain degree that maybe it's a lack of confidence. I know from my own research, when I went out and interviewed some coaches, you know, something that was popping up in the interviews was this kind of like lack of confidence in the, in the sense of actually doing some activities that were kind of outside of their comfort zone per se. Um, And I think it's just being open, like, you know, for coaches, it's being open to having that open mindset and not being too fixed and saying, Mm -hmm. look, we always do the backs and forwards there now. So we're going to be doing the backs and forwards or we're going to do this hand pass and drill now for 15 minutes. Then we're going to go straight into backs and forwards. Like instead of kind of having like that fixed, I mean, if it's working, it's working great if you're enjoying it. But I think sometimes you have to think outside the box a small bit and kind of garner their attention a bit more. Because particularly with younger girls, you know, probably don't have the best of attention spans either. And you need to change kind of and bring a bit of a variety into the sessions. Um, but you're absolutely right. Some coaches would freak out saying, oh, we're going to do dance, <laughs> dance. She's so I don't want to do dance at all. But I think it's just about being open-minded and it's about educating and mm-hmm. empowering coaches to kind of, you know, think outside the box because at the end of the day, it's for the girls, it's not for the coach. Do you get me? Yeah. So, like, mm-hmm. coach should be open to new ideas and because it's going to do the team, you know, good in the long run. And um, so, I think it's like if we can educate coaches and empower coaches as well as girls and parents because we can't forget the parents, parents are very, very important. I always think of it as like a triad, you know, like the parents, the, the coaches, and um, the actual players themselves. Like if you, and if you can merge those three. Um, along with having fun and you know all those other elements that like nine ten out of ten it will be a successful team um, and the girls will be happy yeah I think I think it's also important to kind of remember that like it, these are, are young girls do you know what I mean and I, and I think what you're mentioning earlier in the kind of positive aspect like there's, there's kind of no negative um, kind of things that I can think of from being involved in sport like whether it's you know, people want to be involved from a competitive as- aspect, that's great. But if somebody wants to just stay involved in, in sport from the kind of health benefits and, you know, personal development side, like there's, there's certainly so many, so much more you can get out of sport than not. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's so much that can be that, that can be taken from it. And like, I think in, in what you're saying, like, yes, coaches want to win. And yes, you'll have you know, maybe some, some girls that are incredibly competitive at, at eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, whatever it is. But like, realistically, like, it's it's underage and it's important to think of the bigger picture at that stage is like making it fun like what you're saying and and trying to keep them involved because if a club is looking at it from from a kind of long-term perspective and and maybe this can kind of help settle the nerves of some of the coaches that are kind of not sure about whether implementing dance or go you know thinking outside the box for more fun activities than than drills um it's just that like if you actually manage to retain the numbers, you're going to always have a group of people within the group that are competitive and want to win, want to do whatever. If you manage to keep the numbers big, you're just going to keep up that, that contingent and you're actually going to increase that size of competitiveness. And then you might have people that are, weren't so competitive when they were 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. And by the time that they reach 16, 17, they are mad into it. They're mad into you know pushing themselves and that type of thing. But it's, it's all about keeping the group together because if you don't have the numbers, then you're not going to have the success because you're going to be very, very uh, stuck for, for trying to keep people, um, you know, competing in the, in the, in the later side of things. But um, when it comes to comparing the boys to the girls at that age, like what are the differences that you see there? Like, are, 
is, is it because um you know we see higher volume in in boys teams that there might be that kind of more interest in winning at that point or is there more interest in winning at that age than than the girls have if the social thing is the girls is what the girls want <laughs> Yeah, well, look, I suppose I can only really like speak on behalf of the girls because my research is just focused on girls. And mm -hmm. I have done a bit of research um, in terms of boys as well. Um, and I suppose like there are differences, like there's loads of similarities as well. And um, I think like boys tend to have that like stronger kind of streak for the competitiveness. All right. Um, you know, they obviously do deem like that social environment important, too. But mm -hmm. girls would deem it more important um, and do like that kind of like social support and you know the chit chat as I was saying and kind of just like having their friends around and like feeling connected and that kind of sense of belonging particularly for girls um girls love to conform and they love to be part mm -hmm. of a group and conform to part of a group whereas boys are kind of sometimes can be happy out just kind of going to the training session like just to get the job done mm -hmm. um, now again it's very dependent on age it's very dependent on ability it's dependent, you know, on a lot of different factors, but um, kind do of. Do you like, think that some of it is related to the fact that there's like more media attention and more visibility of male sports players, athletes than there is female? So do you think that from a younger age, young boys are kind of immersed in sports? So like you might have you might have a five year old that is besotted. <laughs> And like a Liverpool fan, <laughs> like, and that's it. And they're like just besotted with football. Is like, is that part of it that that we don't have the same? Like, I I would say, you know, borderline level of respect for women in sport than than people do men. Like, do we think that maybe things might adjust slightly as uh, things in the you know bigger sphere kind of develop as we as we start to you know push the boundaries of women in sport and level that playing field? Like, do you think that that plays a factor at all? Oh, massively. Yeah, I really, really think that. And like role models there is the, is a, is the key word. Um, like I know just even based on my own experience, like when I was playing football and I looked up to the likes of Breach Carkery, Rena Buckley, Angela Walsh, you know, all these players that were my role models. And, you know, when I got that opportunity to play with them, like it was, oh my God, it was, you know, it gave me that motivation. And like, it's so important for young girls, for young boys whatever to, to have someone to look up to but I do think in the in the sense of just recognition um and you know that kind of I suppose media presence um all of that that obviously you know men are still probably getting that bit more um than women and yes of course that's going to have an effect on you know young girls coming up um I, I know I remember watching a video with the 2020 campaign there recently and you know young girls being interviewed and kind of the question put to them like who 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 are your role models mm -hmm. and they could only mention male role models so like that in itself that recognition I think and um, that lack of recognition over the years now it has got better um it has got better but like obviously that's going to have a knock on effect on young children coming up and wanting to aspire to be like somebody mm -hmm. um it's so so important to have that kind of role model figure um for girls and you know thankfully that there's been a shift over the last few years and it is helping with leveling the field as well and, and what we're seeing now is that there's more momentum you know amongst younger girls that are kind of recognizing you know girls regardless of what sport they're playing and um, that they they can they actually see their household names like girls are now household names rather than boys you know constantly taking over the, the conversation at, at dinner time or you know for the Sunday game there on a Sunday at home that like it is happening and there is a shift but I do think role models um I do think that we need to push that a bit more um in Ireland especially um we are doing a good job at the moment but I think we could we could actually be a bit better um at a local level a localized level like not just you know nationally that like, mm -hmm. like I'm talking about like local heroes now like as in you know down in a in a country down in West Cork in a, in a village down there like who who's the, who are the local heroes that can go into the schools that can be the role models, that can have that social support for the young players coming up. It doesn't necessarily mean that these role models have to represent Ireland or, you know, have to have six All-Ireland medals or whatever, but it's it's more just having someone to aspire to and having that social support. And I think if we can push that over the next few years, we'll even see the, the level of fame, we, we'll, we'll see a, an even bigger improvement um, and we'll, we, we'll see that gap in the narrowing. Um, so, yeah, I do think role models, like I know, I can only speak on behalf of my own experience because I've actually 
I had role models that I looked up to and that helped me along the way and that actually getting to play with them was so rewarding. Um, I'll never forget my first training session with Cork. Um, I was only 17 at the time and I was still playing minor and um, I got called up to the senior panel and I, I remember marking um, Valerie Mulcahy for this drill we had to do um, in, in pairs and I was like, oh my God, Like I'm, I'm marking Valerie Mulcahy. <laughs> my god this is amazing and it was just so exciting and that's what you want like you want to instill that confidence and excitement in young girls so they can aspire to be you know the best they can be um whether that's playing for their their school team whether it's playing for their local club or whether it's playing for their county or representing their country no matter what level it is you it comes back to those values like it comes back to instilling that excitement instilling that love and that passion and that kind of togetherness and you know that support so yeah look to, to add to your question yeah I do think we are getting there um and it's, it's things like that that we need to kind of promote keep promoting and definitely get more female role models to try and kind of level the playing field as well um but like you're obviously you know you're a doctor you know you've submitted the PhD and kind of done everything you know and achieved incredible stuff academically like what are you hoping to do with the Gaelic for girls um like study like are you hoping different clubs are gonna like use it, uh, use it as a template to keep girls involved or are you hoping to kind of go in yourself and do it as a job like what's what's going to happen with the for the study I suppose I suppose the Gaelic for Girls um, study now that there is an evidence base behind the program and um, the whole goal really is to like to tailor the program based on the evidence that's there. So um, at the moment, the Ladies Gaelic Football Association have kind of taken on board um, some of the kind of say newer elements to the program um, so that we can kind of get more clubs and get more girls to stay involved as well um I suppose it's, it's never just as easy as that like it's not the case that you just do the PhD and it's finished like research is always evolving so um I suppose in terms of what I would like to get out of it is obviously I, I still have some studies that I'd like to publish um in the sense of like targeting the coach side of it the coach education side of it um I'm kind of setting up some workshops and things at the moment to try and you know, go around to different clubs and actually kind of educate and empower parents and coaches as well, as well as the girls um, and kind of help them come up with kind of strategies and help them come up with some practical tools and tips that they can kind of take on board to try and, you know, give the onus to them and empower them as opposed to just kind of having research sitting in, in a book, like in a library, that it's it's practical and that it can actually impact, it's impactful uh, to the clubs and the coaches so one way of doing that is like my next step now is kind of I'm working on like kind of material for like workshops and I'm going to run a few workshops um, and I'm constantly in touch with the Ladies Gaelic Football Association and the Gaelic for Girls program um, and it also kind of runs into the Gaelic for Teens program as well a small bit mm-hmm. they're linked to the Gaelic for Girls and Gaelic for Teens um, and it's just all about finding new ways like to you know to find out what girls are wanting because it, it's going to change like every generation is different um, and I suppose another thing that's kind of like in the pipeline is I hopefully once COVID is gone if it ever will go um, I would love to do a bit of travelling um, and I would love to take my research on a kind of international scale um, and I'd like to trial out some of the dancing um, abroad and kind of get that multicultural feel for like girls in sport and kind of apply the same principles but in different sports um, so that's kind of like, I, I really, really want to do that. Um, I was supposed to do it this year. I had all intentions to go away traveling <laughs> and do a bit of action research and kind of bring in elements of the Gaelic for Girls with it. But that's just put on hold a while now, but I will get there. Um, and I would love to get that multicultural kind of perspective so that like, what can I learn from other cultures with girls playing similar age, playing different sports? And what can we bring back to the GAA? What can we bring back to Ladies Gaelic Football? What can we bring back to coaches in Ireland um, to try and improve the game constantly? So it's all about improvement. Never stops. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I guess like you've obviously been involved in the sport for a long time. So like what are the differences that you've seen since you started playing right up to now? For ladies football, is it? Yeah. Um, so I suppose really like, you know, when I started playing earlier on, she's it was eleven in school and things. It would have been, you know, very basic in terms of like I I, I feel that just the progression in even the drills and the skills and stuff have massively improved um over the years. And like what we're even we're seeing now, I suppose, with younger players coming up, 
like just for an example, being able to kick off both legs and being able to hand pass off both legs. Like that was never really a thing when we were younger. It was always like, oh, use your stronger leg or use your stronger hand. Mm -hmm. But I suppose over the years, um, and particularly the younger players coming up, even the younger players now coming on to, you know, say the core team or county teams that we're seeing, you know, that confidence in, in skill execution. Um, you know, younger players are able to kind of kick off both sides. You know, their tactical awareness is a bit better. Um, and, you know, they have more of an understanding of, of the game and things. So I do think that tactically, um, as well as skill, um, the skill level has definitely improved. And I think a big one there, that is a massive, massive difference. I think a lot of players kind of my age could agree is that strength and conditioning like never was a thing when we were younger. Like even... I always say like we won five all Irelands in a row without ever going to the gym as a team. Um, we did all our strength and conditioning out in the pitch, all of it. We were hitting each other, we were boxing each other, we were pulling each other, we were dragging each other. All of that was done on the pitch. Um, obviously now we're seeing such an advanced, um, advanced, I suppose, strength and conditioning, speed training, you know, video analysis, all of these kind of factors that are coming in, and it's fantastic to see. Like, because it's really like standardizing the game it's it's putting it at a high standard and it's kind of making it even more competitive champion because every team now is in the gym you know every team is working on their strength resistance training and nutrition plans with all of these extra added features that I suppose we wouldn't have had 10 years ago um and that in itself is after you know advancing the game and kind of advancing the standards of ladies football as well um but sure that's going to happen because we now have more resources we have more funding which is great and um, the WGPA as well you know with the little um, funding and with, with all the 2020 campaign and everything they're doing as well all of this momentum is actually affecting you know skill and performance of players on the pitch um, about time that we're getting all of these extra um, uh, things and extra factors to help with you know performance related kind of factors but that's definitely the biggest difference for me is like we've only been in the gym I'd say since 2016 like with Cork as a team and I have had gym programs and um, before that there was never such thing as going in you know into the the marriage like there and going in together to do a session together um as I said we did our, our, our pulling and dragging and pushing out in the pitch and um, uh, with each other so yeah that's definitely the, the biggest difference and you know it has made such a difference in terms of like fitness um and you know like confidence and skill and everything like that as well you were like I was going to ask you like you were I don't know whether it was just because you were shoved out to do PR for that week and it just so happened that it was that week but when the expenses report was kind of released and it basically said that ladies footballers and kabogi players are basically paying to play um like you were the one of the main ones who came out and you were like yeah like it's true like I can't believe it took a report like for people to kind of notice so like how would you kind of see that like kind of turning around especially with the merging of the players associations and like a second question is like do you think then that kind of hinders it kind of for young girls who maybe are like geez like I hope it does get better like if I do play for Cork and then you've the likes of yourself or like you know all the different girls coming up and like well well actually no I still pay but I really enjoy it I swear yeah no absolutely and I suppose it's kind of something I'm quite passionate about because obviously you know I've, I've kind of conducted research in this area I've kind of experienced it firsthand myself like and I'm not saying you know like I always bring up back to like why are you playing football and why are you playing sport I'm playing it because I love it and like you know anything else should be a bonus like I remember Eamon like you know the late Eamon Ryan and he always used to say that to us like he always used to give out that we don't get enough recognition always but at the same time he'd ground us and he'd always say like why are you, you know, you know, he'd bring us back to why are we playing? And like, you're playing because you love to play. You're playing because you want to get the best out of yourself on the pitch. And I think, you know, in one sense, like, yes, anything else should be a bonus. But on the other hand, like, you're talking about basic necessities. Like, I'm talking about food here now, you know, travel expenses, um, like funding for services like physio, um, you name it. Like, all these basic things that, like, I suppose people would take for granted, but I think like when you're paying yourself, um, I think when I totted it up now, this is only out of like curiosity. I taught it up just for petrol alone. Um, now, I was generous with the with the calculations. Um, I think it was like nearly like it was working out as the same as a teacher's um, salary. 
um, for like what I've spent like traveling to football or that, not the games or anything like that. Um, and like cost, if you think cost, I mean, it could be a big barrier for young girls. You mentioned young girls, um, Joanne, like things like cost, like could actually cause stress, like it could, for families, some families mightn't be able to afford, you know, the cost of training and the cost of petrol and things like something basic like that can actually be a barrier long term. Um, that's just one example. Like for food now would be another example. Like we're only fed in the last like four years, we've only had hot food after training. Um, and like something that kind of like annoys me was like when my brother was playing with Cork at the time, he was playing under 17 and with some development squad hurling. And I remember he used to come home with these lovely meals, like lovely hot meals in the car. And I used to kind of saying, oh yeah, like fine for you. Like, you know, my 16 year old brother is getting a hot meal after training and I'm playing with Cork, you know, five, six, seven years and I can't, and we're not getting fed after training. And so like, when you think of it like that, that like, oh, your recovery, your nutrition, these are basic necessities. Like if you want to compete at a high level, you know, you need to be getting your nutrition in. And like, if the, if the, the men are covered, like for, if they're getting travel expenses, they're getting food after training, they're not paying for their physios or for X, Y, and Z. So like, it's only fair that, you know, that gap is, is narrowing and that women are getting treated with basic respect, really. And um, when you think of that now, to be fair, like you can complain about it and whatnot. Like, I mean, we have, we have won, we've had that success without any of that. So that, that brings me back to my point of why we play and, and like, anything else it's our hobby really like at the end of the day you know we all have everything else going on outside of the football but you know it wouldn't like it, it goes a long way like small things like that when I think of the likes of Anya Terry there or Sullivan down there like and she's nearly traveling you know the distance four or five hundred you know kilometers a training session like it's taking her almost six hours just to get to training alone and never once has she received any you know any money for for petrol or for diesel or whatnot so you know it is quite frustrating but at the same time like it, it's not kind of good to have that attitude you know like it is getting better and like to be fair to the WGPA and like even our own county board in Cork and um, has been so good like in terms of like funding and food and things like that so like we are on that positive momentum and I would hope that even within the next five to ten years the younger generation coming up like we'll have all of that support structures, you know, they will be getting fed after training, they'll be getting the, the fuel that they, the expenses they, they require, they will be getting all of those extra resources like physio, you know, video analysis, all of these things that the men are getting um, because it's only fair, like at the end of the day. Yeah, I think it's a really good attitude that you have and certainly um, a way of pe- keeping people grounded and definitely like, like you're saying like it's it's not it's not a profession it's something that people are participating in because they love because they really enjoy it but then when you do have that comparison like if you have the the situation where you can relate to your brother and other people have brothers or friends or whatever it is and you're kind of looking at that and you're saying like you don't want to get too caught up in it because you want to focus on what you're doing and not get like too stressed out about it but it is it is equality like that is that is something that we're trying to push here is that there there's equality for men and women that people are getting the same opportunities and, and that type of thing and like it's just like it's not it's not huge amounts of 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 um you know kind of resources that, that you're looking for it's it's just the same level that other people are getting to make sure that like you can have the same opportunity and like you like you said you've to, you've obviously when you've had success without it but um it's kind of when you get down to the societal piece of it and you're saying like you're actually not treating people the same because you know it's it's down to kind of gender and and that type of thing like you want to be making sure that um, you know people are, are getting the same opportunity and look like you're saying um, it's not necessarily going to be the same in every county and we know in, in certain uh, situations there are better setups and there are you know other counties that have, may have different resources so um, it, it's it's not going to be the same um, from from one county to the next but I, I would hope that at least within each county that people can be making sure that you're you're trying to look after both sides and you're really trying to afford people the same opportunities um, I guess on on other other slightly dramatic um, things that have happened in in the past couple of months, um, there seems to be a little bit more of of, of spark going on about the semi final versus uh, Galway. How much do you think that kind of affects the the growth from the game and gets away from actually the point of it? Like that kind of um, I guess there's a little bit of 
spitting going on at the moment between people about uh, about what happened. Yeah, I suppose it's it was just quite disappointing, really. Like that's kind of if you have to sum it up, like it's quite it was just quite disappointing just with everything that that happened. Um, you know, at the end of the day, like the players should be you know at the center and at the core and. Like if our needs aren't being met, then you know how can you expect change, positive mm-hmm. change to happen? Um, yeah, it was quite frustrating. It was kind of like when I think back to the day, it was just like a fluster of a day or something. Um, luckily enough, we had stayed up in Dublin the night before, mm-hmm. but we were a bit more kind of like hammer <coughs> and you know kind of grounded because we hadn't left the hotel yet or anything. So, like for, to be honest, we were kind of delighted that we got to play in Cor Park, but at the same time, it was just the last minute last minute <laughs> calmness of it all um like it's just not good enough like at all to be told what an hour or two before a game that oh sorry your game is actually moved to Cork park and it's actually half an hour earlier um when you're preparing for mentally preparing for an all ireland semi final um like if that happened in the men's game there would be uproar um it wouldn't happen you see that's mm-hmm. the difference it just wouldn't happen um and like there's no point in like pointing blame on any one organization or you know one person or whatever because like that, that's not the way to go about it like you know it just the way I look at it like you should always have a plan a a plan b and a plan c and um, because you need to you know you need to meet the needs of, mm-hmm. of the teams and the players and um, things happen in life you know plans don't go accordingly but like you always like at that level should have a backup plan yeah and I suppose the questions we were kind of thinking was like so why wasn't the game in Crow Park in the first place? Mm-hmm. When we at last minute we were shoved into Crow Park, so why couldn't couldn't it have been in Crow Park in the first place? Um, why did why wasn't there a plan B? You know, why wasn't it televised? Why wasn't there a plan for it being televised? Um, and then obviously with Galway, like you know, I, I don't know what happened in the Galway setup, but just based on you know reactions and stuff on Twitter and some of the girls opening up about it, um. It was just very, like, you know, disappointing and you would feel for them because obviously they mightn't have been as prepared as we were in the sense of staying up the night before. And I think some of them were driving themselves as well just due to COVID and everything. So, like, obviously that's going to impact on their mental state and their preparation coming into the game. Um, and they only had like a few minutes to warm up and things like our, our warm up was quite rushed as well. Um, and like it wasn't the best prep going into an all-around semi-final. Now, luckily, we came out the other end of it, but like that shouldn't be the attitude. I mean, it it just simply wasn't good enough in the sense of you know it it nearly an elite sport like, and you know it should just shouldn't happen. Uh, it wouldn't happen the men, so why should it happen us? I think that was the the overarching kind of um, theme was 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 not actually down to the results game at all. It was really down to like the you know the organisation and making sure that people are uh, adequate, adequately prepared and given the opportunity. And um, I think it was just like like you're saying, like it wouldn't happen to the men's team, so why would it happen to women's? And it wasn't some like you know Mickey Mouse game. It wasn't a junior like it wasn't a children's game. It wasn't an underage game. Like these are you know the teams that you're expecting the best from. Like you're you're down to the top four teams in the country. So uh, you should really be giving um you know people the the right facilities and the, and the right opportunities um at that point. Do you know what I mean? Um, what about what's going on in Cork at the moment? I so see you've obviously you've obviously been there for some time. And um, there's a lot of young young talent coming into the into the setup. So what will we what will we see over the next couple of years? Yeah, I know it's quite exciting. Like I suppose over the past few years, Cork ladies has kind of been transitioning as well. And, um, you know, a lot of the older girls kind of had stepped down and um, we've had new management and things like that over the last few years. So it has been like a transitional period, but, you know, it, it has been positive as well, even though we haven't really been winning as much as we'd like to. Um, it has been positive in the sense that, you know, we have the younger kind of generation coming up now and, um, they keep us on our toes for sure um, and it just brings a bit of like positive energy into the training sessions as well um, obviously at the moment we're training on our own like doing our own programs and you know we'd have a few zoom calls and a few kind of strength and conditioning sessions virtually um, at the moment which is quite hard too but you know there is that kind of newness about the team as well you know with some of the younger girls coming up and um like the the average age of the team is quite low as well. Um, I think it's only in the mid twenties. Like it's not like the low twenties. So, um, that's kind of promising in itself as well that we have the youth 
you know, we have we have the energy coming up and and sometimes like you kind of have to experience the losses, I think, as well, to kind of rebuild as a team and to kind of refocus and build up that resilience and that hunger and that drive again. Um, I know like, you know, we we had that six in a row kind of honeymoon period there. So like you can't be winning all of the time and that's just, you know, the joys of sport. I suppose really you you win some, you lose some and you rebuild and there's constant kind of evolution happening all of the time. So no, I'm excited now about this year. I know, as I said, we don't know what's happening in terms of the league. Is it going to go ahead? Um, when will the championship be going ahead? Like hopefully during the summer. And um, so we're all just kind of like getting ourselves right now individually so that when we do go on the pitch, um, when the lockdown restrictions ease a bit, that, you know, we, we'll be ready to go and hopefully we'll be back up to go Park by the end of this year. <laughs> a long honeymoon anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we won't complain. <laughs> yeah, like I was literally gonna ask you, um, like I've done a couple, like you've probably done way more than me, but like a couple of clubs have like got in touch and like, oh, could you do a zoom? And like it usually goes grand, but like they ask me, the non athlete, about like, you know, advice for young girls to keep fit and stuff kind of during COVID. I'm obviously the last person to ask about things like that. So I'm now going to throw this question to you so I can copy your answer. But like in general, like, you know, I suppose you obviously deal with young girls a good chunk anyways because of your PhD and stuff like that. So like what advice would you have for them? Like they're missing out, you know, they, they you know, a couple of age grades might have to be like skipped over for them. Um, like what advice would you tell, would you tell them? Because it doesn't come great for me when I'm like, practice off the left and practice off the right. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I think like, I suppose there are a few things at the moment, like that's just kind of important to focus on for young girls. Like obviously they're not seeing their friends and like, you know, when when I was saying about the research that it's the girls, it's the social interaction mm-hmm. that's so important for girls and they're being kind of deprived of that now. So like the main thing really, like I think at the moment in this current circumstance with lockdown, the most important aspect is actually the the kind of social and the, the kind of well-being aspect rather than the skill. Um, I think like keeping in touch with their friends, like even if it's virtually even doing things like you know, doing a Zoom call, like if a coach can can do a Zoom call where it's a table quiz or something, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's, you know, going out the garden and kicking off both legs, that it's just to try and keep that momentum going for like that social interaction. Obviously, the skill is just as important as well. So like I always kind of say to young girls, like, you know, do small little kind of achieve, achievable tasks. You know, whether it's kind of weekly achievable tasks or daily achievable tasks. So if it's if you're waiting for your dinner or if you're in between a class, you know, if, if they're online working outside, get a ball, kick it off the wall, do some activities, you know, even just having the ball in their hand, like what, whether it's around the house, doing a few solos or whatever, that it just kind of keeps them in the mind of football as well. But like, to be honest, John, I think like the whole the social side like the whole well-being like looking out for each other kind of keeping in contact with their friends is probably the most important thing now because that's the draw that's why they stay involved so you know we want to keep that momentum going so that girls aren't dropping out when we come out of lockdown and girls aren't kind of saying oh because the draw is the friends they'll want to go see their friends yeah trying to keep the momentum of that friendship element as well as kind of practicing the skills and the football um, and kind of just doing like fun challenges and stuff um, you know, that would be probably more targeted at the coaches to kind of run some skill challenges or loads of resources online. Like there's loads of things on YouTube and Instagram that they can kind of follow. Um, but just once it's kind of tipping away, like and keeping in contact with the friends, I think personally their, their well-being and their friendships is the most important aspect right now with lockdown. Yeah, I definitely think it's a, a, a challenging time for everybody at the moment. So the, I think what we're hoping to see is that we will see the return of, um, you know, as many people as kind of left the sports, come back after, you know, we, we kind of get out of this again. Like I know it might seem like the opportune time for some people to kind of walk away from sport, but hopefully, like you're saying, with that social element that everyone will be dying to get back to playing and, and, and uh, you know, training and that kind of thing. And hopefully, um, you know, through kind of profiling the, the research and stuff that you've done, like we would we'll be able to kind of help educate uh, coaches a little bit more into thinking outside the box, making sure that you're actually keeping, uh, you know, young girls and players interested, make sure they're having that fun 
um, because, you know, it's the, the longevity uh, of their relationship with sport is really what we're aiming for, whether it's from, you know, the competitive aspect or like the personal development, because as we said, there's just so, so much that can be gotten from being involved in sport. But I think we've we've covered a lot, a lot today. I think people will learn loads from this. So thanks a million for, for taking the time to talk to us. I'm, I certainly learned a lot. And um, I think you gave a, a good balance between uh, the involvement, but also a bit of insight into your career and and uh, what's what's to come with Cork and everything with that. So thanks again. Oh, thanks a million. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone wants to hit us up on social media, use the hashtag IJS on Twitter at hersport.ie and at Joanna R underscore OX. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram um, at hersport.ie and at Joanna R. And I know Orla's research is available because I watched a YouTube video of it online. So no pressure, Orla. But if you want to be more interested in what she's doing, she's also available on social and that video is available on Ladies Gaelic uh, Football as well for everyone. So thanks very much, Orla. Thank you.